This is Duke University. Man, this is the second panel I've led, and people get quiet right at the perfect time. I don't even have to say anything, and people, <laughs> people are ready. Um, so um, we're honored to have Vivek Wadwa here today to speak with us. Um, before he gets started, I wanted to um, first just recognize a couple people who, uh, as I say, made this event happen. So first and foremost, Danny Martucci. So stand up, Danny, for a second. <laughs> stand up. So um, keep standing, keep standing. So uh, any venture capitalists who are here who are hiring, this is your man right here, Daniel.Martucci at Fuqua.Duke.edu. Uh, he, he put this whole thing together. Um, I was amazed how little that, that I had to do as a co-president to make this happen. I, I was less worried waking up this morning than I really thought I'd be because Danny did such a good job setting everything up. So, so thank you, Danny, very much. Um, and then, of course, the rest of the cabinet we have. Um, so for people who aren't at Fuqua, um, this event was put on 100% by students. So while we have some staff here with the, with the audio equipment and for printing, all the logistics, all of the working with our speakers, all the planning was all done 100% by students. And we did this in the evenings after our internship this summer. We did this in between uh, different classes here at school. And so um, if all the, the cabinet people can just kind of raise their hands or, or stand up and just kind of recognize yourselves. Um, so everybody here, thank you. Uh, everybody here put in time and effort to make this happen, and we wouldn't be able to make it happen without those people. So, um, so thank you. Um, one thing that I want to um, surprise our panelists by is <laughs> we didn't tell them this was the first time we did this either. So this is the first annual entrepreneurship symposium. Um, so we didn't have any kind of knowledge base to build off of. We didn't have any kind of past practices to build on. <laughs> so we kind of lied to the speakers by saying we had all this experience <laughs> and we had done this before. <laughs> Um, so surprise. I think it would have come anyway. So, but I, so I think I think we did a good job, and so this is something we hope that we, we grow upon at Fuqua, and next year, first year that we're here now, we'll we'll take the lead and we'll build on this and make it even better for next year, and it'll be something that's sustaining over the life uh, of, of Fuqua. So, um, so we'll look for it next year too. So, um, without without being said, let's move forward, and, and I have the honor of introducing Vivek. Um, Vivek told me to keep it short in his introduction, so I will. Uh, he is an academic. An entrepreneur that's, been, that's turned academic, he's posts uh, both at Harvard Law School, Stanford, and over at the Pratt School of Engineering here at Duke. Uh, he is recognized. Berkeley, Berkeley, Berkeley. Berkeley, sorry, Berkeley. <laughs> that's how short I wanted to keep it. I I mean, that's it. like saying UNC versus Duke and getting yeah, those yeah. wrong. So you I don't apologize. Do that. <laughs> um, so he um, has uh, successfully led some technology companies. He was at Credit Suisse for or short, CSFB uh, in Boston. Uh, and Sear Technologies. Uh, he is recognized as one of the leading academics in entrepreneurship in the country. Uh, he writes for both Business Week and TechCrunch. Uh, and if anybody read the paper today, he knows he's no um, stranger to controversy. Uh, I actually, you know, we reached out to Vivek because over the summer he had engaged in a, a very lively debate uh, with Guy Kawasaki about the value of an MBA for entrepreneurs and thought that was very, very relevant to today's lecture, and, and that'll be what he's addressing uh, in, uh, uh, in his speech today. So without further ado, we're honored to have Vivek Wadwa. Sure. <laughs> you know, as Andrew said, I'm a, I'm a tech guy who became an academic. So I basically brought a different perspective to academia than most, of, most people do, and I also write a lot. Now, I've lived in uh, North Carolina for the last 20 years or so, and uh, for the last year or so, I've been in Silicon Valley. Uh, basically drinking from a fire hose and becoming part of the system and understanding how it works, why it works, what gives Silicon Valley its competitive advantage, and how regions can replicate Silicon Valley's model. I mean, you know, regions all over the world have, have tried. There have been hundreds and hundreds of experiments, of, uh, billions of dollars wasted, I should say, on trying to replicate Silicon Valley. And I've been trying to understand what is Silicon Valley and how do you replicate its model. So those are the topics I've been researching. And I've been writing about a whole bunch of things, globalization, competitive advantage, immigration, uh, workforce development, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, in Silicon Valley, I've lit quite a few fires. I mean, if you follow me on TechCrunch, if you follow me on Twitter, if you, you know, follow the barrage of, of uh, hate mail that I get and comments posted 
online and so on, you'll see that I've touched quite a few chords. Uh, most recently, it was a tiff with uh, TechCrunch founder Mike Carrington. How many of you know what TechCrunch is? Oh, everyone, all right. Not surprised, okay. Then you know who Mike Carrington is as well. I had him uh, come and teach a class uh, uh, to, um, at Berkeley you know, a few days ago, about a week and a half ago. And he said quite a few things which uh, I agreed with. He said quite a few things which I had major, major disagreements with. For example, he went on about how uh, students should just drop out of college. Education is useless. He never learned anything from his school, and therefore everyone else should drop out. What he didn't emphasize was the fact that he became a lawyer, and his experience as a lawyer helped him um, gain a knowledge about Silicon Valley, which led to him starting companies, which led to him founding TechCrunch. And the reason why TechCrunch is what it is is because he's able to take on everyone, create controversy by ripping into super angels for colluding, uh, rip into unethical companies, and, and just understand the practices of Silicon Valley. Education gave him that advantage. He conveniently forgot that. You know, Guy Kawasaki, um, uh, conveniently he forgets the fact that, um, I mean, he, you know, somehow within Silicon Valley, they have this anti-MBA attitude. They seem to think that MBA degrees are bad and you shouldn't hire MBAs. Uh, this, is a, this is a big surprise to me because I'm an MBA myself, but as an academic, people, you know, I don't get tainted for being an, an MBA. But I still have felt it necessary to defend MBAs because some of the most successful entrepreneurs I know, some of the most, business executive, business, most successful business executives I know are MBAs. But again, you've got this mindset in the valley that MBAs are bad. Education is bad. Now, uh, Peter Thiel, the founder of PayPal, made this bizarro uh, uh, challenge at, Tech, at TechCrunch Disrupt a couple of days ago in which he's going to give $100,000 to any student that drops out of school and uh, uh, starts a company. Now, you know, what I questioned was, would he tell his children to drop out of school? I don't think so. I mean, when it comes to himself, he's highly educated. Most you know, successful tech entrepreneurs are highly educated. But they have got this, you know, this thing in their head about, about uh, kids dropping out. I call it Silicon Valley's child soldiers. It's OK for them to be educated. But they want kids to drop out of school so they can, they can start these bizarro you know, companies which don't succeed. And uh, you know, one out of 1,000 will succeed, and they'll make a lot of money on, uh, uh, you know, on the next Facebook thing. But in the meantime, these kids have basically screwed up their entire careers. Because the likelihood of them failing is, is something like 90, 95%. But in the case of dropouts from universities, it's probably 99% or higher. So what happens after you start you fail one company? You'll do another one, and you'll do another one. And maybe you'll get it right, but the chances are if you're a college dropout, you won't. And you'll run out of money after your first, after your first failure. You'll want to join a big company, and they won't give you a job because you don't have a degree. I mean, they, you know, they look at your resume, see this kid has been going around chasing rainbows. We don't want someone who's, uh, who doesn't have the you know, fortitude to complete what they started. So this is the type of nonsense I've been battling in, in Silicon Valley. Now, this week I was going to write an article about another thing which uh, Mike Harrington said. But by the way, I, you know, I respect Mike Harrington very highly for a lot of things. Okay? I'm a big fan of his for having built such a great uh, uh, tech blog. It's the number one tech blog in the world. So I don't want to be disrespectful and negative uh, you know, about someone I like. But on the other hand, he, he said a couple of dumb things which really had me riled up. The other thing he talked about was uh, the need uh, for, comp for students to change the world by building billion dollar businesses. Now, this obsession with changing the world in Silicon Valley really means building yet another stupid t Twitter app or another Facebook app um, and doing more of the same. Because if you go to Silicon Valley, it's a collective mindset. Everyone builds the same old stupid applications. This is a the majority. Then you have the silent minority, which build really industrial class systems which change the world. They build amazing technologies. They learn from each other. They learn from the rest of the network and build amazing, amazing things. But that's a silent minority. Then those are not the companies that get covered by, by TechCrunch. Right? Those are the companies which come out of the nowhere, which everyone poo-poos and ignores. And suddenly, they start gaining momentum. And now everyone jumps on the bandwagons. VCs invest in them. They take credit for having. Uh, uh, you know, nurture these companies from their, from their start and so on and so on. That's a Silicon Valley game. Right. So anyway, uh, what I'm going to do for the rest of my presentation is go through some slides on, on entrepreneurship research that I've done, which tries to dispel some of the myths. Before I do that, I, I got off topic. I was going to talk about Arrington and the next article I'm going to write, because this myth about building billion dollar businesses. Well, guess what? He just sold his uh, tech blog for probably less than $50 million. So despite the fact uh, uh, he's been preaching that you need to build billion dollar businesses, he sells out because that's the right thing to do. If you're graduating, um, uh, you know, I, I encourage you to change the world. I encourage you to build something really meaningful 
and which does good for the world. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a billion dollar business. You can build a hundred million dollar business which does good for the poor in, uh, in uh, the developing world, which you feel good about, which pays the bills for you, and um, um, you know, which sets you up for the rest of your career and, 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 be, as, and be happier than if you had built a billion dollar business. The fact is if you try building a billion dollar business, most likely you'll fail and you'll have nothing to show for it. You're better off cashing out when you can make a few million dollars and then putting that in the bank and then starting again when you're comfortable. So that's the sort of mindset that uh, permeates Silicon Valley, which uh, I've been challenging. And this is why I get, you know, I said on my education blog, if you go and read the comments, I was stunned at the negativity. I was stunned at the nasty emails that I got, the nasty tweets that I got, attacking me left, right, and center for saying that kids should finish education. But it is what it is, and it's the name of the game, and I enjoy it, you know, being in Silicon Valley and taking on these people and uh, showing them that they're wrong. <laughs> All right, let's go to some uh, proper uh, academic research now. I've done, a se I've done several projects which looked at what really is an entrepreneur, because um, it's one thing to talk about anecdote. This, in, this in Silicon Valley, it's all about anecdote. Because you read about Mark Zuckerberg, because you have Ed Williams and you know, the Twitter guys and, and the PayPal guys, you've got a, a, a number of small companies which were founded by uh, inexperienced people which just made it big. The perception is that all companies are like that. I'm going to show you that I've done uh, quite a bit of research which shows that these assumptions are wrong. Uh, for example, uh, the myth in Silicon Valley is that uh, tech entrepreneurs are unmarried, male, rich, college dropouts obsessed with making money. Um, a decade ago, I would have added the word white to that, that you had to be a white, you know, a young college dropout. But now what's happened in Silicon Valley is that 52% of startups are founded by immigrants. And for example, if you're an Indian, uh, arrogant, young college dropout, you're, you're okay as well. Uh, if you're a woman, not okay, I'm going to talk about that. Women are still discriminated against in a big way in Silicon Valley. I'm going to show you some data on that as well. And you know, I hate to say this at Duke, this, these slides are meant for general audiences. Ivy League or elite education providing a huge advantage is a myth. I hate to pop your bubble after you spent fortunes, your parents' savings on coming to Duke. <laughs> but the advantages for coming here aren't what you think they are. I'll talk about that. And then this whole thing, you know, you've got venture capital in the name of your, um, of your club over here. I suggest you change that. Venture capital ain't cool anymore in Silicon Valley. In fact, um, uh, five or 10 years ago, it, it, there was an obsession with venture capital. Venture capitalists were the kings and the king makers. Right now, the VCs are in decline. They're in retreat. I mean, uh, it's now the super angels who are the supermen of Silicon Valley. And tomorrow it'll be something else. But venture capital is imploding rapidly. Five years from now, seven years from now, the VC industry will probably be half of what it is right now because of the stupid things they've done over the last uh, you know, two decades. Actually, last decade is when they've been in, in decline. They've produced less ret lower returns than have uh, uh, some of the stock indexes. So the VCs aren't the kings and the kingmakers anymore. So, so uh, Andrew, I suggest you folks huddle and call it uh, the Entrepreneurship and uh, Success Club or something. I don't know, come up, with a better, <laughs> come up with a better name because VC is out, not cool. <laughs> All right, first of all, uh, this is, uh, I'm going to mix and match different studies here. If I was dealing with a bunch of professors, I'd be a lot more cautious than I'm going to be with this audience. But I'm trying to illustrate some information, uh, so I'm going to mix and match different research projects and different data sets. But first of all, um, uh, this concept about are tech entrepreneurs uh, young college dropouts? They certainly aren't young. The average age of a tech entrepreneur is 39. Okay. They're twice as many over 50 as they are under 25. They're twice as many over, over 60 as they are under, under 20. These are successful uh, tech companies, which made it out of the garage and which now you know, had momentum and were building revenue. So the myth of the average entrepreneur being a young college dropout is, uh, sorry, being, a young, being young is simply a myth. I'm going to show you about education in a second. They also tend to be married with children. You know, the perception is that they're young and unmarried. You've got to build a company before you have children, blah, blah, blah. Fine, you may want to build a company when you're young, but uh, the majority don't. The majority have kids when they start companies. The, uh, they also don't come from rich families. You know, Bill Gates um, probably started this myth because he came from a rich family. But the vast majority of entrepreneurs are middle class. They come from lower, upper, sorry, upper lower class families or lower middle class families. If you think about it, that's what makes sense. If you're ultra rich, you don't need to start a company. You don't need to go have all the heartache and have the failure that a startup is going to bring you, most likely. Okay. 
you're rich. You know, you can live off dad's money. Right? Same thing with extreme poverty. If you're really poor, uh, you're not going to be able to rise above the ashes. Because it's too hard. You're making, you, know, you, you won't get the education you need. You won't be able to, you, to rise above it. Therefore, the profile of entrepreneurs is you know, in, in, the, in the middle class. Tech entrepreneurs tend to be very highly educated. Successful tech entrepreneurs tend to have master's degree and above. They have JDs. They come from a broad variety of, of disciplines. They're not uh, uneducated college dropouts. If you look at the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the degrees that they completed, it's in a whole variety of things. These are tech entrepreneurs I'm talking about. Business accounting, finance, healthcare, arts, humanities, economics, and so on and so on, applied sciences. That's a profile of a typical tech entrepreneur. You don't have to have done a, a master's in computer, uh, computer science or, or be a tech head to start a successful tech company. They're better educated than their parents. There's no surprise over here because uh, uh, you know, um, education has been improving over the, over the past uh, generations. <laughs> this is, a, uh, this is um, an interpretation. It's not factual. <laughs> if you look at the, uh, the average uh, you know, grades that they had in high school versus versus um, <laughs> university. I speculate that the reason why the grades went down was because they drank too much. I'm sh I mean, judging by the faces in this room, it seems you can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> now this is, uh, like I said, this one irks my friends at Harvard when I, when I, when I discuss it there. Education counts, but it doesn't, doesn't matter what school you've gotten, gotten the education from. On the right are the uh, startups with a high school education, in other words, who didn't complete education. On the left are the average of all startups, which include both, you know, both of the right columns. In the middle are the Ivy League uh, founders. The difference between having a degree and not having a degree in the size of company, in the uh, uh, success of the company measured by uh, number of employees and, and sales is huge. It's night and day. So these college dropouts are a bunch of losers, typically. Like I said, maybe one in 100,000 of them will start a Twitter or uh, do something right, or Facebook. But the rest of them are going to be in the, uh, in the category that uh, you know, they're doing well below the average. The delta between average and Ivy League isn't that much. So the type of money you pay to get into um, um, an elite college and for the heartache that parents have when their kids go and get into it, it's not worth it. I've done a lot of other research in what the difference between elite students and non-elite students. The biggest advantage you have is um, your, the networks that you build. So friendly advice. Make the most of your time here at Fuqua to form bonds with, your, with the rest of your friends because many of these people are going to become hot shot CEOs and become very senior executives in other companies, and you want to stay in touch with them. That network is going to be invaluable to you through your lives. So go out and get drunk and uh, make friends with as many people as you can. Friendly advice. <laughs> entrepreneurs tend to be highly experienced. Successful entrepreneurs tend to have Significant numbers of, of uh, years of experience before they, uh, um, before they build their companies. Now, the fact that you're MBA students gives you an advantage because you already had some experience before starting. So starting a, uh, a, a company after an MBA is not a bad idea. Nothing's stopping you. Now, the sad thing uh, in my mind is the, you know, the fact that the majority of the best uh, MBAs from the uh, top universities end up becoming investment bankers. I think that's a waste of, um, you know, waste of talent. It's um, uh, an affront to humanity, basically, to send them investment banking and have them cook the books in some financial institutions. <laughs> Instead, you folks should go out and start companies and, and solve problems and change the world. That's my, my advice to you. <laughs> now, another myth is that uh, entrepreneurs come from entrepreneurial families. A lot of them do, but the majority of them don't. The majority of them are first-time entrepreneurs. Now, if, you're, if you come from an entrepreneurial family, you're more likely to become an entrepreneur than, than not. But not coming from an entrepreneurial family is not an impediment to becoming an entrepreneur. All right. Why do people become entrepreneurs? You know, people think it's all about money. Money is a factor. It's a strong factor there. But there are a whole variety of reasons why become, people become entrepreneurs. That, um, Many of them have always wanted to start, a, start a, a company. Some of them had friends and relatives who were entrepreneurs. They wanted to capitalize on a business idea that they had. They didn't like working for other people. The, the, um, the least important factor 
in starting a company is that they couldn't get jobs. This is another myth that entrepreneurs tend to be unemployable. They're not. Entrepreneurs tend to be very highly employable, except that they're motivated to, to change the world and to do something and to build wealth. Now, the reason why they start at the age of about 40, that's the average age of, of an entrepreneur, is because at, by the time you're 40, you have experience, you have ideas, you know what uh, markets, you, what, you know what your customers need, you know how to deal with customers, you know how corporations work, you know things about finance, you know how to do project plans, all of the things required to run a company. You have those ideas. Okay? And then you reach this point in your life that you want to make it big before you retire. That, uh, yeah, you can keep making money for the next 20 or 30 years, but you're not going to make it rich. You're not going to be able to be independently wealthy. So this is what often leads entrepreneur, uh, people to become entrepreneurs, that they want to build wealth before they retire. Here's another myth. I mean, um, everyone talks about venture capital. This, now, this is an average of all entrepreneurs, including serial entrepreneurs. If you looked at just first-time entrepreneurs, the, the, the proportion taking venture capital is less than 10%. If you looked at successful, successful companies, this is from a sample of, uh, of 552 successful companies. Right? Only 9.8% of the first-time entrepreneurs took venture capital. Only 11% of them took angel capital. So this perception that people have that you have to have venture capital, you have to have angel capital before you can build a company is false. The most, you know, nine out of 10 successful entrepreneurs did not take any financing, nine out of 10. Right? Where did the money come from? Personal savings, friends and families. You beg, borrow and steal from wherever you can. You take bank loans, you, you, you figure it out. That's where successful entrepreneurs come from. So everywhere I go, I come across entrepreneurs, even in Silicon Valley, or I should say, especially in Silicon Valley. I meet entrepreneurs all the time, and everyone you know, bitches and moans about the fact that they, won't, they can't get people to invest in them. This is a consistent complaint everywhere in the world. But the fact is, that it's, it's the same problem everyone has, and people who figure out how to get beyond that achieve success. So it's not all about venture capital, it's not about, all about angel capital. There are many, many, many ways of funding your startup and becoming successful. That's an important lesson that I learned by you know, researching you know, hundreds of entrepreneurs. Success factors, this is really important. We asked successful entrepreneurs what made them successful. The number one factor, 4.4 out of five, is extremely important. Right? The number one factor was the experience that they had. So what makes entrepreneurs successful is work experience, industry experience, a knowledge of markets, that's the number one factor for success. What's the number two factor? Learning from previous successes, learning from previous failures. Uh, you know, these data don't show the number correctly because um, a lot of the entrepreneurs we interviewed hadn't failed. So if you took out the people who had failed and who had succeeded, failure was actually a stronger factor than success was. In other words, what uh, people who had failed told us was that they learned more from failure than they learned from success. I mean, just think about it. I'm saying is, Successful people, the single most, um, the single strongest factors are their experience and their failures and their successes. What's next? Management teams. Surrounding yourself with people who are really smart. And what's after that? Luck. Good fortune. This is a big surprise to me, that if you added up the, the three strongest factors in success are experience, management teams, and luck. Talk to any seasoned entrepreneur, including you know, some of these who made billion dollar companies, and they'll tell you that luck had a lot to play with their success. I was also surprised at how, much, uh, how many people wrote in God, faith, Jesus Christ, Krishna. I mean, you know, in this survey, we had an open item. Uh, people you know, wrote in other reasons for success, and, and, and at the end, what I realized was that entrepreneurs are a lot more pious than, than you think they are. You, you know, the image of them is arrogant, you know, full of themselves. Successful entrepreneurs know that, um, that luck and fortune had a lot to play with their success. Being at the right place at the right time can really uh, make a huge difference. I would go as far as saying that the Zuckerbergs and, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, and a bunch of these, you know, handful of these companies which made it big, the college dropouts, it was all luck and timing. It wasn't execution because you know that they weren't born with the skills in how to, they didn't do an MBA, they didn't learn what you've learned in how to build a company. They had no common sense about them dealing with people. They had no sense of ethics. They didn't have the fortitude to compete with the started. 
They didn't learn the humanities. They didn't learn values. They didn't learn sciences. So they had a very narrow vision. The most likely reason why these people made it big was they happened to be at the right place at the right time, and they had a bunch of greedy venture capitalists that threw money at them, and uh, they were, they were, you know, and surround them with smart people. This is what VCs do, is that they know that it's all about management. So when they invest in a company, they weed out uh, the founders typically and bring in smarter managers when the company start, starts growing up. That's a great value that venture capitalists provide, invaluable uh, part of raising venture capital, is that they teach you how to build a company. So that's probably a strong factor in the success of these, these outliers that made it big. What are the obstacles faced by entrepreneurs? Again, this is on a factor of, a factor of five, of, of five, you know, a factor, of, sorry, a scale of zero to five, one to five. <laughs> Look at it. Everything is like a 1.6, 1 1.8, 1 1.9. What well, this shows you that entrepreneurs are very optimistic. Nothing stops them. The only thing they complain about is the amount of time required. And the second thing they complain about is financing. Everyone complains about not being able to get financing and venture capital. But uh, nothing stops an entrepreneur. What stops others from entrepreneurs? I mean, we asked why the, the peers of uh, these entrepreneurs didn't become entrepreneurs. It's all about uh, uh, risk financing. Andrew, how am I doing for time? How much? Uh, yeah, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. So I'll, I'll talk for another five or seven minutes. Then we'll switch into Q&A mode. Okay, I'm going to go a little bit faster through these. The difference between men and women. I've also looked at uh, the dearth of women in technology. And we looked right to find what the difference was between uh, uh, the, the sexes. We found was they were about the same age. They were, you know, the same marital status, uh, same number of children, same you know, family background. What were the motivations for starting businesses? Almost the same as men. Sources of funding. Um, women put in more funding than men did. But you know, nothing significant. Here, um, uh, perceived challenges, similar challenges. I mean, they were, you know, I was surprised at, at how uneventful this report was. We did a thorough analysis of all the women in our data set with all the men. And frankly, I couldn't find that much difference. And what we did find basically were that uh, women were more likely than men to have a, uh, get, got, you know, obtain funding from a business partner. Yeah, big deal that both sexes are the same reasons for becoming entrepreneurs. Important deal, that uh, there's really no difference between men and women. They had the same life circumstances. Um, women were more motivated uh, to become entrepreneurs when a co-founder recruited them. Yeah, big deal. Both sexes face the same obstacles, and so on and so on. I was surprised at how little difference there was between, because I thought there would be huge differences between the, between the sexes. There wasn't. But this is what the sad part of the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the discussion is, that in the tech firms and in high-tech firms, the number of women uh, tech companies is insignificant. 3% of all tech, which includes a broad variety of industries, 1% of high-tech, which includes the Silicon Valley type of companies that, um, that you, you, know, you read about. There are almost no women CTOs. They're, you can probably count all the women CTOs in Silicon Valley on, your hand, on, the, on the fingers of your hand. They're not to be found there. They contribute to fewer than 5% of patents and open source software, blah, 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 blah. And it's even worse for blacks and, and, my, and Hispanics. Now, the problem over here is that we're leaving out half of our population. And look at the data that when women, uh, women-led companies are actually better run than, men, than male-led companies are, that they're more capital efficient, um, and venture-backed companies run by women have 12% higher revenue than others. Inclu organizations which are inclusive of women in, in the senior levels achieve 35% higher ROE and 34% um, better return to shareholders than those by men. If you look at the schools, there was a time when uh, you wouldn't find women in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, you know, university programs. It's coming to the point that they're going to outnumber men in most uh, professions. Bottom line is that we're really leaving out a big chunk of society. If we want to foster innovation, rather than having to go abroad, bring in immigrants, which I talk about, which are good things to do, rather than having to do all of these things, rather than having to focus on K-12 education and you know, blame everyone and everything, why don't we look at the, uh, the other half of our workforce, the other half of our population that we're leaving out? 
we're excluding women, we're excluding blacks, we're excluding Hispanics from participating in the workforce. They could be doing a lot to boost our economy and to uh, increase productivity and, and innovation in this country. We're not doing that. There, there are systematic biases against women. Very sad situation. All right, I'll do Q&A at this stage. Yes. So when you look at the, the financing for a company, did you look at how, uh, depending on what type of financing you get, whether it's personal savings or venture capital, what the, the kind of end value of the company is? Does that differ along yeah, the Yeah, I wish I had enough data to do that. Because I, I, there's something I really wanted to do was to be able to compare uh, companies financed by self versus venture. Because when we ask these questions, um, we ask them uh, all the sources of, of, of capital. Because he, here's what the problem is that um, even though the, the National Venture Capital Association publishes these bizarre reports every year taking claim for you know, $2.1 trillion of, uh, of growth, $1.2 million, $1.2 trillion of the economy, and so on and so on, any company that they've ever invested in the account is a venture-backed company. So if Bill Gates had lunch with John Doerr in 1984, and John Doerr paid for lunch, uh, the National Venture Capital Association counts it as a VC investment. The fact is that venture capitalists step in once a company has been successful. They don't invest in risk. They don't invest in startups. They invest once a company has reached a point that needs to start growing. So who do you give credit for in that case? I mean, I, I, I would not give it to the venture capitalist. I'd give it to the entrepreneur for taking the risk. And uh, almost every company uh, in our data set started off with the entrepreneur you know, begging and borrowing from their parents. Or their, you know, or their uncles, or going to their, dipping into their personal savings and starting their companies. And then when they got to a point, then the VC stepped in. When the VC stepped in. Right. Question? Uh, you talked about the, the other half, Hispanics, Blacks, uh, women. And entrepreneurship is kind of inherently a bottom-up type of thing. Well, you suggest perhaps doing something top-down to help no, the, the, the problem, uh, the question is about uh, if entrepreneurship is indeed bottom up, which I agree with, then um, uh, what can we do about it is, is the way I interpret your question, right? Um, first of all, we've we got to realize that there's a problem here, that um, if you follow the debates on TechCrunch, again, the battle I've had with Mike Harrington and so on, he wrote a post saying, hey, it ain't, you know, don't blame the men, it's your fault, women. And you've also had a lot of other uh, uh, people saying it's women have, a, I mean, the women who complain have a chip on their shoulder. I've been in panel discussions in which women have ripped me apart for being condescending. Okay. The problem with it is that first you have to recognize there's a problem. Then you understand where the problem comes in. Uh, women aren't studying, um, studying math and science. Uh, actually, they are beginning to study it. They're not getting into engineering because it's considered to be a male dominated uh, thing. Parents have this uh, vision in their head that engineers have to be guys. And women can do other things. Okay, so it starts with the parents. It gets into education. And, and um, then when women do join companies, they drop out before they reach senior level positions because they're discriminated against. And they feel uh, a bias against them. So uh, um, basically, there's a system-wide problem in the United States. I mean, it's also in other countries, but I'm focused on the United States. So you have to understand where the problems are and then figure out how to fix it. And now my solution to the women's problem really is that they have to do what, you know, what Indians did. Um, 30 years ago, the proportion of Indian of, of, of companies started by, by people from India was zero in Silicon Valley. Okay. 1995 to 2005, 15.5% of all startups, uh, out of the 52% um, founded by immigrants, were founded by Indians. Now, uh, in 2000, Indians, uh, India born constituted 6% of the Silicon Valley working population. How do you take 6% of the population and have them starting 15.5% of the companies in the most innovative, the most ruthless, you know, most uh, um, um, uh, difficult lands in the, in the world? Well, what happened here was that Indians, the first uh, the few who achieved success, said, you know, we got a problem. There's a glass ceiling. We're being discriminated against. We have to help each other, uh, each other and rise above this thing. So they started coaching and mentoring each other, started forming uh, organizations which, which systematically help each other, and they achieved success. If Indians can do it within one generation, being from, you know, perceived, being perceived, uh, you know, as beggars and uh, snake charmers, and low-level engineers to now being CEOs and having, uh, you know, the, the masses worry about Indians taking their jobs away, why can't women do that? What has to happen is you need to have a women's movement, women's women helping others. Uh, one of the big problems is that women who succeed don't help women who haven't succeeded. 
they um, they've had to fight the you know the the male boys club and and they've joined it to achieve success. So they consider themselves macho. They're above it all. They're not going to help other women. They're part of the male boys club. So they don't help each other. So it has to start from ground up by them mentoring each other, helping each other. But you also have to recognize there's a problem and work systematically towards fixing it. There's a systematic bias against women in America. Yeah. Question? So in this morning's article, you talk about the difference between Silicon Valley and the Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, Triangle area. And I've started entrepreneurial councils in Charlotte, Asheville, and now in Raleigh. And isn't it a cultural problem? I mean, you put on your slide that even in Silicon Valley, the number one reason for not starting a company is risk. Yes. I'd say that mentality here is a much higher percentage than what you have there. Absolutely, 100% correct. So are the people of Silicon Valley, do they, does that region attract more risk takers? Yeah. or? That's, that's, a, that's a great, it's a great question. On the entrepreneur side, yeah. but on the investment side, too. Yeah. You know, one of the things that surprised me when I got to Silicon Valley, here you meet people who've been successful or who are starting companies, they tell you about what they're doing. And um, uh, you talk to anyone in Silicon Valley, they tell you about what they're doing in the first sentence. Second sentence, the sentence they tell you about how many companies they screwed up. They boast about their failure. Because what, the mindset in Silicon Valley is that before you succeed, you have to fail a number of times. And every time you fail, you learn from it. That's not the mindset here. We're embarrassed about failure. It's the same problem in Boston. Okay? So the culture of, 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 uh, of hiding failure is prevalent over here. The other thing which is different about Silicon Valley is the um, openness about, uh, about the networks. You go to Pete's Coffee at, you know, any, anywhere there, and you'll see entrepreneurs meeting each other, exchanging ideas, and so on. And they're competing with each other. During the day, they compete with each other. In the evenings, they uh, collaborate with each other. This whole culture of openness and, and uh, informality is, again, a Silicon Valley thing. Here, everyone is dressed up. I mean, I'm surprised that people are wearing suits. I mean, you, you dress like that at uh, Stanford or Berkeley, and people will laugh at you. you. I don't think you could get into the Berkeley campus with a suit on. Jean is a national dress of California. I mean, I, I, I actually had jeans in my bag, and I, I, the last minute I said, oh, I'm going to Duke. I better wear a, a proper trouser. I didn't wear my jeans here. But when I give talks at Berkeley, I, I dare not dress up. It's a culture of informality. So there's a big cultural difference between here and there. But what the, the biggest thing is, uh, you know, my conclusion after studying why, why Silicon Valley works is that my conclusion is that Silicon Valley is a giant social network that all you do over there is meet. Every evening, you have multiple events to go to. Four out of seven days a week, I'm going to parties. I'm going to different networking events in Silicon Valley, meeting people. You go to events, you meet a who's who. I mean, it's just amazing. People you read about in the newspapers, they bump, you bump into them, and you start chatting with them. You're, you're all equal to that. There's no aura of invincibility. I mean, I, I can drop name after name after name of a big person that I met. They know who I am, and they treat me as an equal, and we treat everyone else as an equal. So, that's the magic of Silicon Valley. Now, how can you rec recreate it in RTP? Long discussion, which I'm not going to have over here. But you made some good points. But we're still doing okay. No, we're not doing okay. No, not at all. No, 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 no. RTP is a backwater. It's in dismal shape. We've been, so we've been patting ourselves on the back in RTP for the last 20 years that I've been here. RTP is, is declining. It's not, it's not ascending. So there's nothing to be proud of for this region. You know, for example, the vast majority of graduates who is sitting in this room are not going to stay in an RTP when they, when they graduate. They're going to be out of here. The foreign students won't be able to get visas. They're going to go back to their home countries. The rest of the, the people over here, even people who are born in North Carolina, are going to end up going to New York or most likely Silicon Valley uh, or Boston. They're not going to stay here. Big problem. There's a brain drain happening from this local region. And it's, it's not a beehive of, of technical activity. The, our political leaders are you know, misleading themselves by, by, uh, by saying that RTP is a tech center. It's not. It's a joke. Question? As far as uh, the data, uh, I was doing the base on IT. I was wondering how, is it, how does it relate to other uh, areas? One well, of the studies here, we broadened it. We looked at uh, 17 high growth industries. What we found was that uh, entrepreneurs were slightly older than the tech guys. The tech guys were, were slightly younger by year than the others were. But it was almost the same, that they all highly educated. There was little difference between tech entrepreneurs and, other, uh, and entrepreneurs from other high growth industries. Question? So I don't know the answer to this, but how are the returns in the Valley compared to here? Are they better, the same? There's so, there's so few successes here, it's hard to measure it. You know, for example, here we hype the heck out of Red Hat. Most people don't even know Red Hat. There's Red lots Hat. and lots of successes here, that's unfair. There's enough information to give a statistically valid sample. So you can't say that. Are they better or worse? I, I don't know, I haven't looked at the data. 
We should do an analysis. Yeah. And I guess I have to ask you this question. I agree with a lot of the things you said, a lot. We don't have the community, but the Valley was created in a way, in a very, very unique setting. I'm not sure that's the right comparison. Is it better to have more risk, more investment, and more failures? Or is the risky mentality actually breed better technology and better companies? The way I would answer that is to say, look at the difference between Boston and, and Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley had this fewer, less risk, um, you know, play it safe attitude. And you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, Route 128 and Silicon Valley were neck to neck. You would have bet on Route 128 if you had to pick one winner. No one here, I, I'll bet you most of the people here don't know what Route 128 is right now. Boston has been left in the dust by Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley has won in that, in that, uh, in that sense. As, a, as, a, as an area, I mean, we're not measured only by our entrepreneurial successes. I, I think this area wouldn't define itself simply by the tech companies that get created, nor would Boston create itself by the tech companies that create. Yet the Valley is completely, 100% defined by that environment. Is that good? Well, when you talk about RTB, you're talking about RTB the tech center. And I'm talking about RTB the tech center. Is it better to, to trade everything for, for the, 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 the benefit of being the best tech center and having the most failures? Um, I would say yes, you want to have failures, you want to have tech, you want to have growth because Silicon Valley has been powering the, uh, the economy by creating all these great companies and all these innovations. So to innovate, you have to take risk, which, which means you have to ha be, accept failure. You have to be able to break things to, to succeed. Conserv you know, being too conservative and risk averse is not good for the economy. So I, I'm biased here. Right. Right. <laughs> and I became more biased after spending a year in Silicon Valley because I did, while I was here, I didn't realize what made the Silicon Valley uh, turn and how, uh, how powerful its, uh, its, its systems were. This is why no other region in the world has been able to come close to Silicon Valley. It's unassailable right now because of all of the things we talked about. Risk taking, open uh, innovation, attitude, I mean attitude and so on and so on and so on. Right. Any more questions? Andrew, do you want to wrap up? Yeah. Or, um, so. So, well, to sort of thank uh, Vivek for being here, we have a, a signed book from Man. Dan Ariely, Predictably Irrational. And then we also have a, a signed basketball from Coach K to present to you at a later date. Wow. Coach K is across, across the world right now, just right. winning the, the FIBA championships. That's so, invaluable. Yes. So thank <laughs> Thanks, Danny. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us. Good. Um, Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.